Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, good day for all of you. My name is Gurko Yifu. I'm the senior legal officer at the Secretary of the Commission on Biological Diversity. And um, uh, first, I would like to thank the uh, Earth Foundation Secretary for inviting me to uh, make a presentation uh, for this working group. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make the presentation um, um, live or in real time because uh, on the 3rd of May, our one of our subsidiary bodies is going to start its meeting virtually. So all the staff members here. That's why I am um, recording this presentation. Um, hopefully, the secretariat would kindly share this for you. So let me. I have few slides, and let me share those slides and take you through those slides very quickly. So, as I was given um, in the um, guideline for this presentation, the focus of this um, particular meeting is uh, public participation and access to information. Um, in the context of the Convention on Biological Diversity and its protocols. So, uh, what I did in, in this presentation is introduce to you what the Convention and the protocols provide. For first, I'll give you a little bit of a background about the Convention and the protocols, uh, what their objectives are, how they evolved, and became part of the public international law. Then, I'll take you through. Um, the, uh, the, the provisions uh, that exist uh, currently in the Convention as well as in the protocols that uh, have a relationship or uh, that uh, actually focus on public participation and uh, again uh, provisions on access to information. And finally, of course, I would uh, like to highlight some of the relevant uh, rules in the rules of procedure that we have. Uh, with regard to public participation and access to information. So, the CBD, as you probably all of you know, uh, has, has, uh, is a framework convention that was uh, opened for signatures that were negotiated uh, by the, at the early 1990s. And, <clears throat> sorry. And it was open for signature in Rio. It's one of the Rio Conventions. That's why it's called one of the Rio Conventions. And uh, otherwise, it was um, actually adopted in May 1992 in Nairobi. But as I said, it was uh, everything has started in Rio. It's because it's open for signature for governments by governments and regional economic integration organizations. Uh, and uh, at, at Rio, at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, in June 1992. So after the convention in, that was adopted and then entered in force in 1993, it quickly entered in force, by the way, um, then the parties to the convention started to prioritize their, 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 act, their actions, uh, their implementation measures. And uh, for uh, most countries, for most parties, and most of them developing countries, their priority happened to be uh, uh, regulating, having an international regulatory system on the transboundary movements of these modified organisms. And uh, uh, because of that emphasis on uh, the prioritization of this um, particular area of the, uh, of the Convention on Biological Diversity, there's a provision on how living modified organisms need to be handled. There is a general rule there. Uh, then um, in 1995, the, uh, at the second conference of the parties, uh, mm -hmm. the parties agreed to start uh, negotiating a protocol on biosafety. And uh, the, negotiation, the negotiations have started in earnest um, uh, in uh, 1996, July, I guess, in Aarhus, in fact, <laughs> the same city uh, that your convention is named after. Um, and then the negotiations uh, were conducted from 1996 July until um, 
January 2000 in, in through through a working group a working group that was created at Jakarta at the COP at the second meeting of the Conference of the Parties. And then after the adoption of the Catalina Protocol on Biosafety, then parties to this protocol again said that there were there is there was unfinished business in the Catalina Protocol on Biosafety when it was adopted. A number of countries were um, um, uh, were having were uh, looking for having um, liability and redress closed, uh, detailed liability and redress closed in the Catalina Protocol on Biosafety for damage that may be caused by living modified organisms. And uh, that was not possible during the adoption, the negotiation in the adoption of the protocol, the biosafety protocol. But uh, what was possible was the compromise provision in the uh, Cartagena protocol, which says that after the entry into force of the Cartagena protocol, parties will start, uh, will establish a process towards the elaboration of rules and procedures on liability and address. And that's what they did. Uh, that's what they did as soon as the Cartagena protocol entered into force in 2003 on September 11, and the first meeting of the parties took place in uh, February uh, 2004. Uh, the first meeting of the parties uh, took decisions, and one of them was the creation of a working group to negotiate uh, or elaborate the, the rules and procedures on liability and risk. And uh, that working group continued its work and um, its work was completed after six years, almost uh, from 2004 until 2010 October. It took six years and the negotiation took six years and uh, it culminated finally, of course, in the adoption of an agreement of Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress, which was adopted in October 2010 in Nagoya, Japan, uh, when the fifth meeting of the Katayana Protocol parties took place and uh, at the tenth meeting of the Conference of the Parties uh, took place at the same time. Um, at the same time, in fact, there was another protocol which was negotiated for years and adopted at the same time. That is the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing, which was also adopted in October 2010. And uh, we don't know what other instrument may follow or may emerge in the future of this convention, but uh, this is how the CBD evolved, uh, the different protocols emerged and came into place. By the way, all of them are um, effective in terms of um, uh, their status. Uh, the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol has entered into force sometime in 2015, and Nagoya Protocol has also entered into force in 2014 and 2012. So all of these instruments are Part of international law, they are, um, they, 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 yeah, they have entered into. Um, in terms of the objective, you can see I simply uh, try to highlight what the objectives uh, of each of the instruments are, and the objectives are more or less similar, and uh, that's. Uh, because the, the, it is the, the, the origin of all the protocols is the Convention on Biological Diversity. And the Convention on Biological Diversity can, has three objectives, that is promoting conservation of biological diversity, promoting sustainable use of uh, components of biological diversity. And the third one is equitable sharing of benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources. These are the uh, objectives of the convention. And it is these same objectives in different shapes and forms uh, which were translated or which became actually the objectives of the Catalan Protocol on Biosafety, the Nagoya Protocol, as well as well as even the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol, ultimately for biosafety, ultimately for liability and address, for access and benefit sharing. The ultimate objective of all these instruments is, of course, conservation of biological diversity and the sustainable use of uh, the components of biological diversity. Now I'm coming to the to uh, very quickly highlighting some of the provisions that exist in the in the convention. Uh, so this is the convention at the center, simply the CBD, the cover of the booklet that we have. Um, that we have the treaty 
and that we publish the treaty um, uh, in, in the form of and in, in the form of a booklet and this is the cover of the booklet you may know it and so uh, there are some provisions um, uh, which have um, direct relevance to public participation this includes article 13 which is on public education and awareness it allows public participation uh, in procedures for assessment article 10 it is on customary use of biological diversity it is there also in article 10 d one of the sub paragraphs it talks about what provides for the support that uh, local populations need uh, to have in developing and implementing remedial action for uh, during restoration of degraded areas areas where biological diversity has been reduced. The other article is uh, of the convention which has relevance to public participation is Article 23. Um, article 23 is on the convention, the function of the uh, conference of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. And one of the paragraphs talks about admission and participation of observers. We'll come back to that when I um, take you through the uh, rules of procedure it, because this same uh, provision it has been also translated or repeated in the rules of procedure. The other important provision that the CBD has in, on public participation is Article 8J. Article 8J is a, a, a very important article in the, in the convention because it's the, the article which really established the basic elements um, uh, that are required to to protect the biodiversity by protecting, by giving protection and by giving respect and um, by maintaining knowledge, innovations and practices of indigenous peoples and local communities. So in doing so, governments are required to involve indigenous peoples and local communities in accordance with their law, of course. So this is the form of of the participation, that's why I, I brought it here. Uh, there is one um, um, shape there which is not linked with the others. It is simply because uh, the others are operative uh, articles or provisions of the convention, but this one is uh, taken from the, the preamble. In the preamble, there's one, the, the preamble of paragraph which recognize in the Convention of Biological Diversity, which recognizes the vital role that women play in conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity. And uh, this, this preamble uh, not only recognizes their uh, role, but also um, calls upon the need for, uh, also emphasizes or affirms the need for their full participation at all levels of policy making and implementation when it comes to the conservation and sustainability of biological diversity. So this is as far as the convention is concerned. Let's look at the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. The Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety has um, a number of provisions. As you can see, uh, one main provision on public participation is Article 23, Public Awareness and Participation. Uh, and parties are required um, under this article to uh, promote and facilitate public participation, including public awareness of education. As you can see, if you closely look at the article, uh, it has uh, other elements as well. And uh, consulting the public is also an obligation. Of course, th that obligation is subject to um, national laws and regulations. The other uh, provision of the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, which has uh, an, an implied um, public participation aspect, is the socioeconomic consideration, Article 26. Uh, socioeconomic considerations are allowed to be taken into account by parties when they take a decision on whether to whether or not to import living modified organisms. And in doing so, of course, they have to. They have to focus on the value of biological diversity the, uh, the, towards uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. In order to determine this value that biological diversity has um, um, to uh, IPLCs, 
definitely the implication is IPMCs need to take part in that decision taking process. So this is not um, an obligatory um, requirement, but uh, it's an optional one. But uh, it's an important, um, an important provision in the uh, final protocol on biosafety. The other provision is Article 29, just like uh, what we saw under the convention. This uh, article uh, is on the functions, the core functions of the um, meeting of the parties, the conference of the parties, which serves as the meeting of the parties to the Katana Protocol on Biosafety. And one of its paragraphs talks about the admission and participation of observers. And uh, of course, it is subject to the rules of procedure as, as, as the article itself states. Let's look at public participation under uh, the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing. There are some provisions uh, like the uh, Kafana Protocol. Um, there, is a, uh, there is a provision on uh, traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources, which is Article 12. And uh, that uh, particular provision uh, has a paragraph which uh, requires parties uh, to, uh, to allow the effective participation of indigenous peoples and local communities when they deal with traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. Um, this has, of course, uh, in fact, has a linkage with Article 8J of the, uh, of the convention that we saw earlier. The other relevant article on public participation under the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing is Article 6. Uh, in that article, there are uh, there is a, a paragraph um, uh, where um, the consent or approval and involvement of IPLC is required in uh, developing um, access, the, the conditions and the rules or for access to genetic resources. That's what the article 6, uh, paragraph 3F is providing for. Uh, the other article, the relevant article is article 26, uh, similar to uh, the convention as well as the Katana uh, Protocol on Biosafety. This is again uh, the article which provides for the functions of the um, Conference of the Parties that serves as the meeting of the parties to the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing. And uh, similar to the other instruments, it has a clause in paragraph 8 on uh, admissions, the importance of admission and participation of observers. And this is again subject to the rules of procedure. We'll come back to that. Like the convention, uh, the um, Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing has one paragraph which exactly talks uh, about um, about the role of women and the, the need for their full participation uh, at all levels of policy making and implementation um, for the ultimate uh, objective to achieve the ultimate objective of biodiversity conservation. So that has got recognition. It's a preambular paragraph um, under the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit. Sure. So let's see the uh, that is as far as um, public participation is concerned. Now let's turn to provisions provisions that exist uh, under the three instruments on access to information. You can I am not going to read these articles here. I have uh, put the text of the articles here so that you can read uh, when you get a copy of the uh, this presentation, of course. In the convention, there is again under Article 13, Public Education and Awareness, which has a paragraph on access to information. Um, there's Article 17 on exchange of information under the convention. Uh, it, then that has also uh, uh, something to do with uh, access to information. Uh, under the Katana Protocol on Biosafety, there is Article 20, which established the Biosafety Clearinghouse. A Biosafety Clearinghouse is an, uh, uh, an online tool uh, that uh, it's a regulatory tool. It's created under the, the Katana Protocol on Biosafety as a, a tool for exchange of information, information, very important information on decisions to import living modified organisms on who is responsible for what kind of decisions, etc. 
all this information national uh, that is being generated uh, that is available at the national level has to be made as a matter of requirement has to be made available uh, to the biosafety clearing house and the biosafety clearing house is available to everyone to the general public as well as to users uh, yeah, those uh, institutions and individuals who are dealing with living modified organisms have access to the biosafety clearing house. So this is, uh, in fact, the major the major tool or mechanism that we have under the Cartagena Protocol on biosafety that uh, ensures access uh, is provided, access to information is provided to the general public. There is the, the other article, Article 23, which we saw it, uh, in the context of public participation. Um, uh, so that same article has a paragraph on uh, on public participation, on access to information. And in fact, it talks about access to um, uh, decision making process as well and access uh, governments or parties should um, uh, do their best to inform their public about the means of public access to the biosafety clearinghouse. You can read uh, in detail this, uh, these paragraphs. Uh, let me turn to the the, uh, the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing. Um, there's Article 14, uh, which is similar to the Catena Protocol on Biosafety, creates or establishes a clearinghouse mechanism. The purpose is the same. Very important uh, information uh, in, uh, in, on, on access to genetic resources, on benefit sharing, uh, are required to be made available uh, through this uh, clearinghouse and this clearinghouse and the uh, 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 together with the information is accessible to to the general public and to everyone. So uh, this is a huge mechanism um, that ensures access to information uh, under the uh, Nagoya Protocol on, uh, on Access and Benefit Sharing. There is another article, Article 17, on monitoring the utilization of genetic resources. Under this article, the, the, one of the uh, requirements is to issue internationally recognized certificate of compliance by um, provider countries um, uh, and that certificate needs to be made available to the access and benefit sharing clearinghouse and sh it shall contain some minimum amount of information um, uh, which is specified in, in the article itself in paragraph four of um, Article 17, and this is a, a very important information that um, that helps the public, um, well, that provides the public access um, to such an important information um, with regard to what's happening in, um, uh, with genetic resources, with traditional knowledge in their in their, in their country, in their community, in their region. Article 18 of the NABA protocol on access uh, and benefit sharing is about compliance with mutually agreed terms. And um, in this article, there is a, a requirement uh, to a party, to parties that they have to take effective measures regarding a number of things, including access to justice. So access to justice is uh, in fact much broader and uh, much effective uh, than access to information, but it, it is, it is, you can, one can understand access to justice uh, to embody uh, or to include also access to information. Uh, you cannot have access to justice effectively unless you have access to information, uh, unless you have an effective access to information in the first place. That's why I brought it here. Article 21, awareness raising. Um, there is a requirement uh, to disseminate information through the National Clearing House, and uh, the parties need to do that, uh, and that means uh, at the end of the day, 
um, uh, national dissemination of information on access and benefit sharing will help the public, will help um, uh, the institutions that are uh, that have interest in access and benefit sharing on it, to genetic resources, access to genetic resources, and, and tradi to traditional knowledge. Um, uh, an opportunity um, to know uh, and to understand what is happening. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, then the other article under the Nagoya Protocol on Access Benefit and Benefit Sharing is uh, on capacity building. Um, and under this provision, there is a requirement that information should be shared on capacity building and development initiatives through the ABS Clearinghouse. So the ABS Clearinghouse uh, as a means uh, of disseminating information includes also information on capacity building and development uh, initiatives or availabilities or programs that are out there, uh, whether in, uh, in, 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 uh, within a party or within a region or even at global. Uh, level. So that is it as far as provisions on access to information is concerned under the convention and the two protocols. Let's now look at the rules of procedure. There are three main um, areas of uh, elements of rules of procedure when it comes to public um, participation and public and access to information. The first one is uh, the, the the fact that uh, observers are allowed uh, to take part in uh, the process of these treaties. In their, their, they are allowed to participate in their meet in meetings, big or small meetings, and um, to uh, to the extent they have uh, interest and uh, involvement in. The, in the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity in one way or the other, um, any uh, body or agency who wishes to be uh, part of or to be represented in the CBD processes uh, will be provided uh, an observer status, uh, unless, of course, uh, there is an objection to one or the other body or agency by at least one third of the parties uh, uh, in any at any given uh, meeting, but uh, this general rule rule seven exists uh, upon which the secretariat is always uh, uh, accepting, using to accept um, a request for uh, representation, a request for participation in the in the processes that are uh, being um, uh, conducted under, under the Convention and the protocols. Uh, in the rules of procedure, there is also uh, a rule uh, which uh, requires that the, the sessions of the Conference of the Parties and the subsidiary bodies to be held in public. So th that is also um, um, a, a rule uh, that confirms actually the, these instruments, these international law instruments provide access to information um, because uh, the parties to these treaties, the parties to the convention, the parties to these protocols conduct their business in public. Um, if, if there is, um, uh, in rare cases, um, need for closed session, of course, they have the right to do so. But uh, in practice, we have never seen a closed session of the COP uh, or COP MOPs or even the subsidiary bodies so far. The other practice that really ensures um, at least access to information is uh, the, the practice of webcasting. Our, all our sessions, especially the big uh, meeting sessions uh, are um, as, uh, as far as the technology is available. Since the technology uh, became available, um, we have started and we are continued to webcast all our meetings of the conference of the parties and meetings of the subsidiary bodies. This is also uh, a means of uh, 
um, uh, allowing the public to participate, allowing the public to have access to information. These are the main uh, rules of procedure, uh, the main rules that you find, that one finds in the rules of procedure that really uh, confirms how this process, the treaties processes allow public participation and access to information. Um, in conclusion, I would say that uh, some of the public participation uh, requirements of the Convention, the protocols are subject to national legislation. Um, uh, this is more so with respect to participation in decision making processes. Um, of course, um, yes, the, 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 that public participation requirement, public participation right is available. But that right is subject to the uh, availability of the right itself in national laws, in national uh, legislation. Uh, so one can draw that conclusion by uh, from, from looking at these provisions of the convention and the protocol. The other conclusion that one can make is the clearing houses and the information sharing mechanisms under the Cartagena and the Nagoya protocols allow the sharing of more information on the implementation of the protocols, including decisions taken by parties. Uh, as I said earlier, the, the clearing houses in both the uh, Cartagena protocol on biosafety and the Nagoya protocol on access and benefit, benefit sharing uh, host very important information. Uh, that information, uh, as long as it exists at the national level, at the domestic level, has to be made available to these clearing houses that are being administered um, by the Secretariat at a global level. And uh, this information, uh, this information, the set of information uh, that uh, artists have to make available uh, through these clearing houses is. Um, uh, includes uh, legislation on biosafety, legislation on access and benefit sharing, decisions that are taken on whether to import or not to uh, in, uh, maybe modified organisms or genetically modified organisms, um, uh, uh, any uh, approval uh, to grant access to genetic resources, to grant access to traditional knowledge. Um, uh, all this information is available in the clearing houses. So there's uh, more in, in opportunity, I guess, uh, given to the public uh, to have access to information through the clearing houses that are uh, that have been established under the two protocols and that are being administered um, by the secretariat. Overall, one can probably conclude that the provisions of these treaties, the rules of procedure taken together, and as well as the practice, um, they really allow, um, to a certain extent, of course, it's not uh, there's nothing absolute here, but to a certain extent, because some of the uh, participation, the extent of participation, the access to information, by the public is subject to national legislation, as we say, but still there is that space, that room, that uh, that opportunity for the public to participate and for the public to have access to information uh, on the implementation uh, of the requirements of these treaties. So overall, uh, these are international treaties uh, that really uh, allow public participation that really provide access to information and uh, by being so uh, probably it's consistent with what the ARUS convention is um, trying to do uh, in, in, in terms of widening, broadening public participation and, and giving uh, access, more access to information to the general public. Uh, I think that's it. That's what I have, um, and uh, I'm sorry I won't be here there to uh, answer your questions. But uh, I am really grateful for this opportunity, and uh, I hope uh, we will have a successful uh, discussion. Thank you so much.